Secretary Jim Mattis is a Pacific Northwest native who served more than four decades as a Marine infantry officer. Following two years as the Secretary of Defense, he returned to the Northwest and is now the Davies Family Distinguished Fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. Call Sign Chaos is the account of Mattis's storied career, from wide-ranging leadership roles in three wars to ultimately commanding a quarter of a million troops across the Middle East. Along the way, he recounts his foundational experiences as a leader, exacting the lessons he has learned about the nature of war fighting and peacemaking, the importance of allies, and the strategic dilemmas now facing our nation. He makes it clear why America must return to a strategic footing so as to not just continue winning battles, but fighting wars. Mattis divides his book into three parts, direct leadership, executive leadership, and strategic leadership. In the first part, he recalls his early experiences leading Marines into battle when he knew his troops as well as his own brothers. In the second part, he explores what it means to command thousands of troops and how to adapt your leadership style to ensure your intent is understood by your most junior troops so that they can form their own mission. In the third part, Mattis describes the challenges and techniques of leadership at the strategic level, where military leaders reconcile war's grim realities with political leaders' human aspirations, where complexity reigns and the consequences of imprudence are severe, even catastrophic. Call Sign Chaos is a memoir of a life of war fighting and lifelong learning, following along as he rises from Marine recruit to four-star general. It is a journey about learning to lead and a story about how he, through constant study and action, developed a unique leadership philosophy that made him into the man he is today. General Mattis will be in conversation tonight with David Brooks, political and cultural commentator who writes for the New York Times, and he is also currently a commentator on PBS NewsHour, NPR's All Things Considered, and NBC's Meet the Press. He is, the author's, he is the author of Bobos in Paradise, The New Upper Class and How They Got There, and On Paradise Drive, How We Live Now and Always Have in Future Tense. In March 2011, he came out with his third book, The Social Animal, The Hidden Sources of Love, Character, and Achievement, which was a number one New York Times bestseller, and his latest, The Second Mountain, will not stop flying off the shelves at Politics and Prose since it was published in April. Please help me welcome to the stage David Brooks and Secretary Jim Mattis. This is the first time I've ever seen an author work the crowd before the event. <laughs> um, so obviously the campaign has begun. Um, now oh. I, <laughs> uh, uh, there are many surprises. I loved reading the book. I had a chance to write a column about it. Uh, and there are many surprises. The first surprise was that you were hitchhiking around the West at age 13. Mm -hmm. Now you give us the basic facts about your family, but give us the emotional tone of your family and the, what kind of house did you grow up in? Was it? Military? Did it prepare you for the Marine Corps, or was it? No, I, I was not brought up in a military family at all. Uh, we liked being outdoors. My family would go camping on weekends. Uh, my mother and father had traveled the world as young people. My father in the Merchant Marine for 15 years. My mother uh, was in the Army G2 uh, crypto clerk and went off to South Africa and worked there in our consulate. So the world was a place to be explored. Uh, they didn't know I was hitchhiking at first, but they figured it out. And it was a, it was a more trusting time, ladies and gentlemen. You could, you could hitchhike around America and be picked up by the cross-country truck driver uh, in the afternoon, not knowing where you'd stop that night, or uh, by the night nurse coming off duty at early in the morning who'd pick you up and drive you to the next town. And it was, it was a great education. Uh, now, uh, you were not the most devoted student, uh, either in high school or in the what passed for college, uh, but right. you are perhaps one of the hardest working people I've ever met. So when did that kick in? Well, I, I never thought of what I've done as a lot of work, uh, just the enjoyment of being around the people. But, uh, you know, it was the sort of thing where I wanted to be outdoors. I wanted to go explore the world, and I love books. Uh, 
but I don't think I was uh, much of a student because it seemed too structured to me and everyone had a different way of learning. But one thing too, when you join the Marines, everybody has to read certain books when they join the Marines. There's a reading list. Uh, and then when you make corporal, there's another whole new reading list. And when you make sergeant, they say, well, guess what? Here's another reading list. Matter of fact, when generals make general, yep, they get handed a new reading list, go back to work. And I, they weren't really interested in your midlife crisis when you said, well, I didn't have time to do the reading. You know, they, uh, they were very adamant about it. And little by little, I think, uh, frankly, I didn't like a lot of the jobs in the Marines, but I loved being around uh, young infantrymen who would do the dirtiest jobs, most dangerous jobs. For example, I learned to hate minefields at age 21 but I loved being around young Marines who would crawl into minefields, biting their lip, uh, still in their teens, probing and looking for something they didn't want to find, knowing if they missed it, it their buddy could get killed. And that's the only reason I stuck around that low paying outfit for 40 odd years was, <laughs> <clears throat> I just loved being around the young sailors and Marines who, uh, who made up the units in the infantry. Yeah, the, this book is almost a love letter to the Marine Corps. And when you're, when you're in, in with the troops, and especially infantry, you feel your happiness in the pros. And when you're off in Brussels at NATO, a little less. Uh, so what is it, the Marine Corps takes, I've always been impressed by this, it takes young men and women who were hanging around the 7-Eleven one day at high school or college mm -hmm. and doing all the stuff young men and women do, and it turns them into something different. How does that happen? Well, I think, first of all, uh, they're all volunteers, David. And for whatever damage that has done to our country. I came in at a time when I probably wouldn't have joined the Marines. I, I can't say that for sure, but I doubt I would have joined the Marines had it not been for the draft. Uh, you had to go, that's all there was to it. Uh, you can try and duck out of it, but uh, you know, you had your, even at a young age, you don't wanna look like you're, you're not fully a man. Uh, the, some went off to Canada, it was 1969, the Vietnam War was going on but we thought we'd never be allowed to come home for our brother's wedding or our parents' anniversary. We didn't think they'd be brought home as heroes a few years later, which they were. So you signed up and you went off to do your patriotic duty. And while there, that's when I found that the Marines really valued excellence. Uh, I remember once I'd run in the obstacle course <clears throat> in a, against another platoon, our whole platoon running through, see who can get through fastest. And I realized I was gonna beat this guy easily. Uh, physical things came easy to me. So I didn't give it everything I needed to. I still beat him. And you get to the end, you climb the rope and you touch the top and then you drop down and you're feeling so proud of yourself. And this gunnery sergeant lit into me and he said, you weren't giving it 100%. He said, I'm fed up with you. Uh, he accused me of actually being a communist sent in to destroy the Marine Corps. <laughs> Uh, and he went all over me. He said, let me make it clear to you, young man. He said, uh, when you give 100%, I'll be 100% satisfied. You give 99%, I'll be 100% dissatisfied. And when someone that big is in your face, you know, it kind of, you get the idea. Yeah. So you start giving, you start learning about what the word commitment means and you apply it from then on, whether it be to your family, to your community, uh, wherever you go, that that stays with you. You, you go. It's a form, very formative experience. Yeah, there's one passage in here where you say the commitment to excellence is uncompromised, um, mm -hmm. uh, and personal sensitivities are irrelevant. Yes. If when there's a mistake. Now, when I read that sentence, I thought the last 60 years of American culture just crumbled uh, because we, in most workplaces, in most schools, personal sensitivity is not making people feel bad is a high priority. Do you think that comes at the expense of excellence sometimes, or is the Marine Corps yeah. just its own place? Well, it's a good point. Uh, the, the fact is that <clears throat> on the battlefield, there is no trophy for second place, much less ninth place. So what you've got to win. And so you're brought up with this very grim set of skills by people who've been there, they've done it, and they're, they're not really interested in reasons why it cannot happen. Uh, you've got, you simply got to carry through. But pretty soon what carries you along is you know everybody beside you is also going to be there. When trouble looms, they will come, even at the risk of their life. So it's humbling in some sense, but it's energizing. You're now part of something bigger than yourself. And I think that is really what expands you. It, it does not, 
it, it's, it does not shrink you to be part of an organization. It expands you to have that sense. Yeah. Now, early in your career, you were doing, running recruitment, I think, in your home area. And it, Northwest. Yeah, and it sounded like you were working 80-hour weeks or some long amount, and there was a, an officer who didn't want to do that. Uh, who mm -hmm. challenged you and said, "I just you know, maybe he had a family or something. Yeah. I didn't want to." And you busted him, and I guess ended his career. Mm -hmm. um, what about work-life balance? Well, there is a work <clears throat> excuse me, there is a work-life balance, but what it's got to be is everybody is doing everything they can, so you don't dump more of the work on someone else. <clears throat> and in this case, I just made it clear to the the young man that uh, you could be a marine or you could be a quitter, but you couldn't be both. So I'm not going to care more about your career than you care. You tell me what you, which you want to be. You want to be a Marine? I will I'll coach you. I'll be with you all the way through. And he decided to test it. And the thing to remember is, especially with the number of young, uh, very good seeing how many students are here tonight. Uh, we got the count back here, actually, David and I, before he walked out. And you're, you always want to help people but I won't even waste my time as a coach. And that's really what I did about 95% of my time in the Marines. I was a coach. Uh, but I will not waste my time coaching someone who's not humble. I'm, it, it's, it's worthless. You, you might as well just give it up. And so if they're not humble enough to recognize they need coaching, <clears throat> if you're not, if I'm not that, that humble, then really you can't help them. And in any organization, as you become a leader, you don't get to be a leader because you have a rank on your collar, you have a, a title on your call, your business card. Your juniors make you a leader, determine if you're a leader or not. They will vote about whether or not you're a leader. And on a battlefield, they'll follow a 19-year-old PFC if the 28-year-old captain doesn't know what he's doing. So just remember, too, that at times, even Jesus of Nazareth had one out of 12 go to crap on him. And, <laughs> You know, and you just gotta, you gotta, you gotta maintain a firing squad. You know, you gotta get rid of. <clears throat> I missed that part of the Gospels. But, um, <laughs> uh, let's talk about. Let's go to the coaching. Um, Dwight Eisenhower had Fox Connor, uh, uh, who was his mentor, really formed him. Did you have somebody who like? You, that was my coach. That was the guy who made me who I am. You know, I've had to think about the coaching. Who who were my mentors, ladies and gentlemen, because. On this tour now, you, you look back on things. The whole point was to pass on lessons that I had learned what worked for me for you to consider, not to follow blindly, but just say, does this make sense to you? And my, you, you, when you're in the infantry, your, your fortunes rise or fall on your NCOs. <clears throat> you're living out there with 40 sailors and Marines. You're in the mud. You, you have no better living conditions. Uh, you're the last officer in the chain of command, so you must represent all the orders that come down to those who are in our line of work go into the intimate killing zone, the, the close quarters battle. And my first uh, platoon sergeant was an immigrant from the British uh, Indies in the Caribbean. His name was Wayne Johnson, Corporal Wayne Johnson. Senior enlisted guy out of 40 sailors and marines. He was only 21 years old, and I was 21 years old at the same time. And of course, with a name like Wayne Johnson, everyone called him John Wayne, uh, <laughs> absolutely. And then he'd been overseas for a long time. He taught me not just what I did, but he told me what not to do, what an officer doesn't do. Just leave that alone. Let other people handle certain things. And I'm starting to learn right then about delegating, decision-making, and responsibility. My second platoon sergeant, also a corporal, was Manuel Rivera. He was from, this is a 1973 time frame. You weren't born here, born yet, most of you in the audience. And he was an immigrant from Mexico. <clears throat> and he was the same way. He was stern. Uh, and yet he was a guy who could get down there and show a Marine who was having trouble how to do something right. Uh, and I, I used to just admire the way he could, in a few sharp words, get someone's attention and then just turn the person in the right direction, mostly spiritually, the physical, the mental followed. And then my third uh, platoon sergeant, I finally got a staff sergeant with about 15 years in the Marine Corps, Remy Lebrun. He's from Quebec, immigrant again. So I was also learning about the immigrant role in the U.S. military and just how they were overrepresented. And it was a broadening experience because somehow, you know, growing up in my hometown, you know, 99% of people I was with were, 
were uh, native born, you know, that, that sort of thing. And why do I bring it up? Because the military by its very nature will expand you in a way that no other organization will, I think, uh, in sense of diversity. The mentors come in all shapes and sizes and they come from all parts of the world. Now, when you're leading, um, one of the things that comes through in the book is, as I say, your affection for the Marines. Yet, mm -hmm. I assume there are times when you're leading any size unit, you have to be unpopular. Uh, so is, are, were you close friends with the people right around you or was there always some distance between you and those under your command? I, I used to encourage, I was taught this and used to encourage that officers should come as close to the line that separates them from their troops as they can uh, and be themselves, but without giving up one ounce of their authority because there is going to come a time when the chips are down and you're going to have to point to someone and point toward the enemy and, and tell them to go. And at that point, everything in that young man's body is going to tell him, don't get up, don't move against them, you're, you know what can happen, uh, and you're going to need that authority. But you use a very, very critical word because it took me 25 years to come to the word affection. You need trust and you need respect. Trust is the coin of the realm. If you don't have that as a leader, then you probably aren't going to accomplish much of anything. <clears throat> I knew that the troops respected their leaders. The uh, Marine Corps screens out anywhere from 40 to 60% of the already screened people who try to become officers. But why were some units so good? Why were some 40-man platoons as good as a 150-man infantry company when they closed with the enemy? And it took me a long time to figure out. It was, the other word was affection. For example, in, in four months around me as a two-star, I had 29 sailors and Marines. And in four months, 17 of the 29 were killed or injured, killed or wounded around me. And when casualties start getting around 50%, that's not good. It's a place called Al Anbar Province and uh, the Sunni Triangle. Very tough fighting, day in, day out. But what held them together was an affection for each other that no matter what happened, they would keep fighting. They would keep fighting and fighting and fighting. And the affection is the opposite in its own way of popularity. Popularity brings favoritism. Uh, that this is one of the reasons why you'll f see the military so anti anything that would bring other impulses inside combat assault units. Because when you're pointing to someone and sending them forward, you can read in some very old uh, textbooks about when favoritism uh, rotted a unit right out from underneath, a king here, Solomon, uh, and others. So the point is that affection is the sort of thing that does not rest on any sort of favoritism. It's not, not about being popular. When you're going around making people get up and move uh, when they don't want to, when you're telling people that the first thing you have to do when they have clean uniforms on is jump into a mud puddle because you don't want them to be reluctant to hit the deck in the mud uh, when they get shot at, you're not doing things that make you popular. But you find too that if you've been honest with your troops, if they trust you, then they'll stick with you. For example, deep inside a city that we've lost boys taken halfway through it and we know we've got the enemy on the run and we're halted and then we're told to pull out. And a television camera gets shoved in a young uh, light machine gunner's face, a blonde haired, filthy, dirty Marine who's got his machine gun over his shoulders are coming out and the reporter saying, this is terrible, that you must feel terrible. God, it's terrible, you lost your troop, your buddies, it's terrible, now you're being told to pull back, you must feel terrible. And he's a slow-talking kid from down south, and he just kind of looks over at the camera. He says, it doesn't matter, we'll hunt him down somewhere else and kill him. Now, yeah, it is, it, is, it shows the spirit of these, these, young, uh, these young folks who sign up, young men and women who sign up, this blank check uh, payable to the, all of you in this room to uh, protect this experiment we call America. But I would also tell you that if we hadn't been honest with that young man all along, if we hadn't kept him informed, if he didn't trust us, he could have said, yeah, it's terrible. And when morale goes down in a combat unit, you know right away you're gonna lose more people. It's affection, I think, that builds on the trust and respect, but it's not popularity. 
as you were talking, I was reminded there was a thing called the Grant Study, which has studied men who graduated from college in 1940 and followed them through life. They got drafted into World War II. Some rose to become colonels and majors. Some stayed privates or whatever. And they wanted to know what correlates with success in warfare. <clears throat> and it wasn't IQ. It wasn't socioeconomic status. It wasn't physical courage. It was relationship with mother. And that the mm -hmm. men who had received a flood of love <clears throat> from their moms knew how to give it to their men. And mm -hmm. so it, we're a deep emotional reservoir. You referenced Fallujah. Uh, now this was, uh, <clears throat> and this is the first battle of Fallujah. Um, this was an unpleasant moment. Uh, there were a lot of, in a war filled with a lot of unpleasant moments. Mm -hmm. You were given orders to take a town. And if I remember, you didn't like being told to take it. You didn't like being told to stop once you started taking yeah. it. So how do you march your, you or yourself personally and your men and women through um, an operation that you think is a mistake? Well, to explain just a little background uh, to all of you, uh, we were in a place, Al Anbar, uh, the enemy was rising up, uh, what would become known as the Sunni uh, uprising against us. Uh, a guy named Zarqawi was leading it. He had plenty of help. Um, it turned out we were outnumbered there and we were under troop caps, <clears throat> so we couldn't even bring in additional troops, even though we had them waiting in Southern California to come in. And so uh, shortly after we took over the district uh, from the 82nd Airborne Division, uh, four contractors while wandering on the battlefield, we used to uh, be very upset about this sort of stuff, wandered into a town called Fallujah. They got killed, uh, burned, and their bodies hung up. People were very angry here in this town. And it was a tribal town. <clears throat> so what we did was we, we knew we'd get a hold of the tribal elements who uh, basically hated the people who'd done it, and we'd find where the bodies were. We'd get the bodies back, and then we'd find the people who'd done it, hunt them down and kill them. But I wanted to do it with, with raids into their homes at night, that sort of thing. I didn't want to charge into a city of 350,000 people. Uh, so after a couple of days of arguing about this, I finally received the order, you will move against Fallujah and stay in the fight. <clears throat> and I, I knew that my boss and the boss above him agreed with me. They'd fought the good fight with Washington. And that's why it's called orders, ladies and gentlemen. It's not called likes. You don't have to like it. You know, you got to do it. <clears throat> so I said, okay, let's do it. And then what you have to do is you have to say, I'm going to do this as well as if I'd thought up the plan in the first place. You have to embrace it because if you go into something like that halfway, then people are going to suffer. <clears throat> so I only had two assault battalions. We got as many of the innocent people evacuated as we could, about over 300 and some odd thousand, 310,000. And then we went in swinging. And I would just tell you that the one qualification I put on it, <clears throat> I said, okay, I'm going, but don't stop me. And deep inside the city, the enemy using very effective information warfare, for example, photos, uh, film footage of artillery rounds crashing into Fallujah. In fact, we never fired one artillery round into Fallujah in the first Battle of Fallujah. I would have if we needed it, but the, uh, the helicopter gunships and the tanks were giving us what we needed. We didn't fire artillery. Uh, but it was played as if we were doing that on BBC and other uh, networks here in this town. Uh, footage that was, uh, I think they call them uh, trailers or something, guys who, who trail, bring stuff into them. And so we got stopped deep inside the city with my lads literally with hand grenade range apart, and we were losing people in this thing. And then we got ordered to pull back, and that's when the young machine gunner was asked about it. You just have to do the best you can because sometimes life doesn't go the way you want it to go. And so you, you give it 100%. How do you command a battle like that? I've, I've spoken to people who were in the battle and they're busting through walls. That's house by house. <clears throat> right. So what do you, you're a general. How do, you, how do you command? Well, first of all, you have to make sure you laid out very clearly what you want. And so the, the commander's intent is what it's called. And I said, my aim is to destroy the terrorist stronghold inside Fallujah at the least cost to the innocent as possible. And I want to move quickly with the two assault battalions, and I'll bring in more battalions as soon as possible. But you must move fast enough that they can't resupply, because we knew they hadn't gotten ready for the battle either. So there was a value to doing it this way. Then what you do, uh, you go around, you talk to the assault units, 
<clears throat> write down, you, you literally walk the line with them, you pull them together in small groups, explain it, and then say, now you have to ask me questions. And they'd ask questions, and you go back and forth. And they would, if you, ha if you could draw out of them what was really concerning them inside, then you would have a unit ready to go. And you just do this, that's the leader's job. But once you've made it that clear, if you've trained your people, and they were very, very well trained, uh, the assault units, then you take your hands off the steering wheel. You just take it off and give the initiative. If you trust your young NCOs, your young officers, the young officers keep the social energy going into the units. They're calling for the support. The young NCOs are doing their job. They'll blow holes in the sides of buildings so they don't have to go through the front gate, so they don't have to go in the way that's bought and booby-trapped. They know what they're doing. But if you start getting into a place where you want to control, like in the Marines, you know what we call it? We don't call it command and control. How many of you have heard of that word before? Command and control, a lot of you, right? Business users. Marines believe in command and feedback. In other words, you, we, we told you what we need done. Now you'll see me on the front lines up there listening to them, going to talk to the wounded Marines, what happened, how, how did it happen, that sort of thing. You get feedback from 100 different directions. But take your hands off the wheel after you've clearly said what needs to be done. Yeah. Now in the uh, gruel Greek phalanx, as, as they're <clears throat> preparing for battle, the men were huddled in these covered by their shields, mm -hmm. and they were so terrified you could hear that they could hear each other's teeth chattering. Yeah. Now, have you felt that kind of fear on in the course of your career, either in the battlefield or somewhere else? Uh, I mean, yeah, absolutely. You feel it. Uh, you're trained to overcome it. <clears throat> um, there's there's things you can do to overcome it. Your body will also help you. Your mind will help you get through that. It will slow some things down, but. Uh, the most important, I mean, there's nothing strange about fear. I mean, you're, you're, it's going to be there. It's part of every fight. Um, first time I got shot at, I couldn't taste for three days. You know, scared the hell out of me. <laughs> <clears throat> um, but I think that uh, you're, you're well enough trained. But what really drives you forward, you know, it, because you're probably going to be very, very tired. It is, I, I cannot even explain to you how tired you get in combat. Some of you in here... <laughs> I've been there, you know what I'm referring to. Uh, so the fear is going to be there coupled with a fatigue that goes beyond words. Um, there's going to be also uh, yeah, just a sense almost at times of doom or an exhilaration going back and forth moment by moment. And the adrenaline's pumping and pretty soon, you know, you're, you're, pretty, you're pretty tired out. You know, it's just there. And anyone can get tired enough it just doesn't work. But what keeps you going, really, is that affection, that love for one another, that I don't care what happens, I'm not going to leave him uncovered. So you're back up on your knee firing for your buddy as he goes forward, and the muscle memory kicks in. And the Marines are real good at, at socializing people to that level of commitment when they come in. So you, you go into a fight with a lot of confidence. Yeah. Now, after that battle in Fallujah, you were ordered back to the States, or maybe it's your, just your... your uh, Time in Iraq. Yeah, I've been up. there two years, yeah. And so you uh, went to Fort Leavenworth and you wrote a book with Dave Petraeus and others, uh, The oh, Coin yeah. Manual. Uh, a, what was it like? And this was an intellectually revolutionary document, uh, the whole the coin doctrine. Mm -hmm. um, a, what was it like writing a book at, back at home while the Marines were fighting in Iraq? Was that just part of the rotation? And what was the intellectual process behind that? Because it really did revolutionize doctrine. Well, it, it took advantage of the lessons learned, but this is the normal, uh, <clears throat> the normal behavior of a learning organization. If the organization is learning, you bring some of your people back. Uh, Dave and I were old friends. We'd served together as colonels, brigadier generals, <clears throat> and, and now as two stars, uh, or then next as three stars. He was at Fort Leavenworth, I was at Quantico. So we just decided we had to write something, and we said, okay, let's map out the chapters, and our staff did it. And we said, okay, Army's going to take these chapters, Marines these chapters, and we'd meet uh, just like the Senate and the House of Representatives. In the, you know, <laughs> that, that, worked, uh, that worked so well. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we could give them a lesson. Uh, <laughs> we turned out the book very, very quickly. Uh, and the most important thing in it to me was something called design. Uh, go back to Einstein told when confronting a problem, how to save the earth, how would he compose his thinking? And allegedly he said I'd spend, if he was given one hour to save the world, he said I'd spend 55 minutes defining the problem, save the world in five minutes. 
So the Marines, we got to take the define the problem chapter, the, the, the uh, campaign design chapter. But for all of you, as you go into these, these kinds of issues, whether it be in corporations or school districts, in your local community, uh, wherever you're at, you know, def take your time to define the problem to what I call a Jesuit's level of satisfaction, okay? Don't go charging into a war and then you pull a statue down in the Capitol and say, well, uh, now what do we do? That's not a good idea. That's not a good idea, okay? So you, we put the book out. We, we think we uh, learned a lot while we were there, David and I. And then when we put it out, we changed the training, the doctrine, the weapons, the uniforms, mostly the cultural aspects of the services going in. And once we got enough people on the ground there, we were able to turn it around. Yeah. One of my favorite sections of your book is you're told you're going to be helping lead an invasion of Iraq. And immediately, one of the first things you do is read Xenophon and other books about the invasion of Iraq. And there's a good, my favorite passage of the book is where you say that if you haven't read hundreds of books, you're functionally illiterate, um, which yeah. is good for politics and prose. But uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, you really did. I mean, you found time to read at every spot and probably maybe every day of your career. Well, again, the Marine Corps expected it. Uh, the Marine Corps doesn't mind you making mistakes. I made a lot of mistakes, got chewed out, and the Marine Corps doesn't look out for your, your ego or anything when they go after you. Uh, but they also promoted me every time I made a mistake. They promoted me every time, and I think the Marine Corps made it clear that they weren't looking for any, they, they expected me to study, but they didn't expect me not to make mistakes. And for all of you, because you're all going to be leaders of something if you want to be, that's, that's your choice. Uh, that's the opportunity you will have. And there are leaders at all ranks in society and on the job and families. Uh, make sure you know the difference between a mistake and a lack of discipline. Now in the Naval Service, in the Marines, we used to say, if you run the ship on the rocks, you're gonna get hammered. This is the varsity, you're going down. And if you're senior, you're probably gonna go out. If you're young, you'll get a second chance, maybe, as long as it's not moral turpitude. But a mistake, human beings make mistakes. I've made a lot of mistakes. Let me tell you, let me show you how great a mistake I've made. In the middle of the open desert, I command 1,250 sailors, Marines, and Arabs in my battalion, an assault battalion. We're going through minefield now, and in the middle of an open desert, I get my battalion surrounded. Okay, that's almost impossible. Okay? <laughs> I mean, I was at the top of my game, but it was the wrong game to be at the top. Of, okay? <laughs> and as I went into this, and, and you know when your mortars guys are setting up four mortars shooting this way and four shooting that way, you're not brilliant, okay? <laughs> <clears throat> and later on, you know, I was seeing the Marines, they got me out of that mess too. And, uh, and I was walking around and say, hey, you were just checking us, right, Colonel? Just want to see if we still had it. I said, no, I, I messed up. <laughs> I got called over to the Red Mill headquarters because they told us we're get, we have to break through to Kuwait City tonight. They're starting to murder innocent Kuwaitis in the street. The Iraqi army was retreating in front of us and they were committing atrocities. So they said, you got to get there. You got to stop them. And it was getting late. We were under the smoke cloud. So it was going to be difficult. The colonel called us together, the, the four lieutenant colonels who would lead the attack into Kuwait City. <clears throat> And, and when we got done and we're all moving back to our vehicle, go back to our units and say, Let, and here's the orders, let's go. Uh, and uh, he called over to me and says, hey, Jim. And I walked over to him and he said, you learned something today? I said, yes, sir. He said, okay. Didn't say anymore. Didn't have to rub it in. Just he wanted to make sure he knew that I knew he, he saw it. He wanted to make sure that it was a big deal, but he didn't make a big deal of it. He thought, you know, that's enough. And he knows I'm going into another attack I don't need some song and dance about tactics right now. I learned the lesson, you know? Uh, so I think too, if you can help people get through mistakes and how use them as learning opportunities, it doesn't in any way uh, accept lack of discipline That's not, and moral turpitude or something like that. But for crying out loud, let's not have a no mistakes world. I went to jail twice, twice before I went into the Marines. <clears throat> and, and I would just tell you that uh, the Marines forgave that too. <laughs> you know? uh, when you make a mistake or when you make a decision that's not a mistake and there are losses, do you torture yourself about it or do you just say, learn the lesson, I can't, and move on? 
Well, you you do not uh, forget when you, your lads lose their lives or what you did, and uh, you just have to live with it. Let me ask um, two final questions that are political. Um, first is about President Obama, who relieved you of command, mm -hmm. and you and you have some. There were clear places in the book where you really did not think they were providing the right civilian leadership. Mm -hmm. Just describe that relationship and and your over your overview thoughts of him. I I found the president curious. Um, I would be in meetings with him, uh, but uh, I. Here's the thing. You you heard when we were introduced <clears throat> that at times uh, military leaders have to wa bring wars, what she referred to as the grim realities, into the discussion with politicians who are trying to go for peace and prosperity and, and health care and education, all the things we care about. Again, we, we defend the country so it can have those things. And so somehow we have to bring that thinking in to the decisions made in war, which is completely alien to what we're trying to do in this beautiful democracy and bring the harmony of our team together in this country, or at least I hope we are. And so with President Obama, I thought that if we pulled all the troops out in the intelligence community, the CIA came down to brief me uh, before I went up to the discussions in the White House each time. And they said, uh, and they'd brief, and they say, well, here's what the enemy will do and all this. And one time I'm sitting there, and all my admirals and generals are sitting in the back of the room, and the CIA briefers are there briefing me, and sometimes I wouldn't say anything for like a long minute or something, or two minutes after a brief. And uh, so I'm sitting there, and my guys are all smiling, knowing somebody's going to break the silence here for this thing. And the young lady who was leading the brief <clears throat> from CIA, she said, let me put it this way, General. You pull all our troops out at the end of the year, and by the summer of 2014, now this is in 2011, by the summer of 2014, an Al-Qaeda group stronger than ever, more well-resourced than ever, and more vicious than ever will come out. I'm not sure which one. I think I know who it is. I'm not going to tell you what I think I know. I'm telling you, they will, what, one of these groups will come, and you'll have to put troops back in. <clears throat> Our intelligence community, regardless of anything you've read in the newspaper, uh, in terms of other people's assessments, one of the best in the world, if not the best. Um, maybe not in each region, it's not the top, but overall, it's the top. And so I would carry that message in and that and on the issues of Iran, uh, the president uh, decided I would go. And ladies and gentlemen, the words are, you serve at the pleasure of the president. It's written right into the commission you get. <clears throat> and I bear the president no rancor. He had the right to do it. Those words have to mean something when he keeps you there or when you leave. Uh, I left uh, there in the uh, 2013 uh, and 14 months later, we had to go back in with troops, with millions of people turned into refugees by the very people, ISIS, that the, civilian, that the CIA briefer uh, had briefed on. Um, 50,000 uh, dead and wounded in the first uh, months of what was going on, cities falling, uh, girls as young as eight and seven years old being raped and taken into being made slaves. That's the catastrophic results of a strategic decision. So I, I gave what I thought was the, the strongest uh, admonition why we must not do this. But if you believe in the Constitution, if you're going to uphold the Constitution, then you keep faith with it. And you, you carry out the orders of the civilians unless you think they're immoral. And while I thought it was strategically unsound, under me, we did pull those troops out because that was his right as the elected commander in chief. And you do not suddenly think that you start telling the civilians when we're going to war or when we're not going to war. So okay. you just have to deal with it. <clears throat> this is my final <clears throat> question before we get to your questions. Um, and on this book tour, um, <clears throat> roughly 500 journalists have asked you to dish on President Trump. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and so far the batting average is zero for 500. Mm -hmm. um, yet I'm gonna try. Okay. <laughs> uh, as I've heard the argument about why you, you don't want to 
discuss the current president. I've heard you say military people should not discuss a sitting president just for civilian military relationships. But you have no military experience with President Trump. You were a civilian political appointee. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not aware that political appointees and cabinet secretaries are, that there's been much hesitancy about not talking about a, <laughs> a, uh, a sitting president. So yeah. isn't that the right precedent to serve? Yeah, to we're, we're, we're all formed by our formative experiences. <clears throat> Where I come from, first of all, you ride for the brand. I'm from out west, and you ride for the brand. And the brand was the U.S. Constitution. The U.S. Constitution says, you know, if a man is elected, woman is elected commander-in-chief, they're the commander-in-chief. Secondly, if a Republican or Democrat president calls you and says, I want you to do something, you don't sit up on the wall of the castle wringing your hands. You don't pull a hamlet saying, no, should I do it or not? Just go to work. If you think you're ready to do the job, roll up your sleeves, go in, and give it your best shot. Now, when you leave an administration over a policy difference, and you write that policy difference in a public letter and you lay it out, then you, you've, you've said why you left. That's all there is to it. And it was over alliances. It was over who's our adversaries. And I was upfront about it. And I had a straightforward talk with the president, he and I alone in the Oval Office. We had a straightforward talk uh, walking out of the office. It was not an adversarial relationship that we had. Those people who think I was doing things behind his back I was very open with the president what I was doing. We'd have lunch most weeks if we were both in town, just the two of us, or maybe the Secretary of State there. <clears throat> and we, we, we were always right up front with each other. But when you leave office, we've got a million troops right now, and many of them are deployed at sea. <clears throat> They're fighting in Syria tonight and in Afghanistan. They don't need a former cabinet official coming out and distracting from what the Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, the President is saying to do right now. <clears throat> I just, I don't believe that is helpful. The French call it, by the way, a devoir de reserve, a duty of quiet for a while. Now, I'm not against coming out and talking about strategy or policy disagreements, and I did it with the, the last several presidents. Uh, you know, I make clear what I think about how we did Iraq under, a, under President Bush. <clears throat> but I don't believe that, that mil people with a military background should come out and make political assessments of civilian leaders. And let me be very clear. George Washington at Newburgh said, you will not do what you're trying to do here. And these were his officers with a legitimate gripe called the Newburgh Mutiny for a reason. And he went out and he looked them right in the eye and said, you will not do it. General Bradley, after World War II, Great Army General said, when a general retires his uniform, he should retire his tongue when it comes to political matters. When I was introduced here tonight, when I walked out there and talked to some of you in the line, many people called me general. I may tell you I'm no longer a general, but in many people's minds, I'm still a general. And when the time comes <clears throat> that our military people start going out into the if they want to run for office, I'm all for it. You want to run for office, throw your hat in a ring? Okay, that's okay. But you don't go out and take part in partisan politics and start seeing how many generals you can line up on this person versus that person. Our military is the most admired institution in terms of the confidence of the American people year in and year out on the Pew polls for a reason. We're apolitical. And when we start getting uh, into the, po the politics of it, I think the bipartisan nature of the support, I had 87% of the Republican Democrats vote, representatives, congressmen, and senators vote for a record-breaking budget last December before I left. 87%. Do you think that would have happened if we were politicizing the Department of Defense? Senator Vandenberg, Michigan, late 1940s, right-wing Republican senator is challenged in his home district, in his home state. Why are you working that terrible Democrat, Truman, President Truman? And basically he says, the defense of our country is nonpartisan. And the quote you'll hear often is, politics ends at the, stops at the water's edge. I stay with that tradition. I, I hear the other pleas, but Secretary Carter, Ash Carter, good friend, 
my predecessor under President Obama refused to engage in political discussions. He would, and he would order the military officers sitting next to him on Capitol Hill not to answer a question that a congressman was asking because it was purely political. We have got to keep the military out of this. None of us have any fear of the military moving into the political realm in an authoritative way. But believe me, most countries in the world aren't like that. I've gone on too long. <clears throat> full answer. Okay. Um. Thank you. Uh, so now uh, we'll move from the questions I wrote on a notepad to the questions I wrote on note cards. Um, now <clears throat> these are your questions. Uh, the military awards uh, medals for physical courage. Is there ever a way to give awards for moral courage? I think the rewards for moral courage are promotion. Uh, by the time you get uh, up in rank in the, uh, in the armed forces, uh, you, you really do get promoted for your moral courage. It's not just uh, because you know how to do the science of war, or the art of war. <clears throat> Matter of fact, I've sat on many selection boards as you do as you get up higher in rank. By the time you're, for example, a lieutenant colonel, you're on selection boards for who's going to be promoted to captain. And when you're a, when you're a three, four, or four-star general, you're, you're selecting who's going to be the one- and two-star generals. And the surest way to get passed over, the absolute easiest way to be told, we're not going to promote that guy, that gal, is if they have shown a lack of integrity or moral courage. So it's really the selection because any institution gets the behavior it rewards. Now, if the institution gets rotten, then you can have a problem with this. And it's happened to institutions. It's happened to corporations. And it's why you have to be very alert to this to keep your personal and managerial integrity. But I think the way the, the, the award that we would give would be probably promotion. As a junior officer in cyber, I see most field grade and general officers struggle with technology and the cost to DOD as, as a result. How do we fix this before <clears> it's too late? Yeah, I, uh, I think one of the things you have to do is make certain your organization is fit for its time. Uh, a few years ago, uh, we set up U.S. Cyber Command, <clears throat> which is a combatant command. For example, I've commanded U.S. Joint Forces Command, uh, and I've commanded U.S. Central Command. That was the one fighting the wars in the Middle East. We now have a command, and we've had it for quite some time, U.S. Cyber Command, and it works on that very issue. <clears throat> so what you have now are people who are being promoted, NCOs and officers, for their skill in that very area. So what you have to do if you see technology coming forward like this, you have to organize the institution so you start promoting people based on their capability there. We've been doing that for some time. At U.S. Central Command, for example, if you walked into certain operations room, uh, you'd see the intelligence people sitting there, and then you'd see the guy who's coordinating the strikes coming off the aircraft carriers, who's coordinating strikes from the Air Force, who's coordinating Army missiles. And you'd see sitting right next to them some of these cyber folks sitting right next to them. It just, it's like just another one of the supporting arms as we integrate it all. Some of, the, uh, there's some of them are civilians sitting there at the higher headquarters because we have not grown all that inside the military rank. But it's coming fast with the young people coming in now. Uh, some of the girls had more tattoos than a sailor in the fleet. <laughs> uh, some of the guys had more earrings than any girl I dated. Uh, <laughs> but they were darn good at their job, and we, we loved having them there. They were great. <clears throat> what is the greatest national security threat facing the United States? I break the question into two what, uh, as far as the greatest threats. Uh, in terms of the, the, this world where we focus a lot on terrorism, Terrorism is going to be with us. It's an ambient threat. It's not going away real soon. Uh, it reflects other things. We're going to have to fight it and then try to set the conditions of education, of economic opportunity that's going to reduce the, the need for people to think they've got to go for that violent way. And we're just going to have to fight the rest of them. But in this world today, the bigger threats are what I would call great power competition. A Russia and China that want to give veto authority to themselves over surrounding nations, economic decisions, security decisions, diplomatic decisions. Uh, uh, China that would, their president would stand in the Rose Garden with President Obama 
and say they would not militarize the Spratly Islands, and then they went in and put weapons into the Spratly Islands, a Russia that would invade Crimea and take it over. We're going to have to recognize that Russia is what Russia is under Putin, not the Russia we want it to be. So that's where I would see it now. Terrorism goes on. We've got China and Russia. Russia, the declining power, <coughs> I think in some ways that actually makes them more dangerous in the short term. But in the long term, as I told my Chinese counterpart, we're going to have to find a way between you and I, between our nations, to manage our differences because we're two nuclear armed powers and we don't want to be as stupid as the Europeans twice in the 20th century and engulf the world in a doggone war. And whenever I hear about this Thucydides trap, ladies and gentlemen, about a rising power and a power that's big and so it's just got to go to war. Number one, it hasn't always gone to war, but Thucydides was a smart guy. In the nuclear age, he would have written a different book. Okay, just trust me on this. <laughs> I'm old enough, I've talked to him, okay? <laughs> uh, but I think that, but there's a bigger threat to, to me. Go back and read Abraham Lincoln's talk at the Young Men's Lyceum in 1858, when he talks about there's no army coming from Europe or Africa that's going to come over here and cross the Blue Ridge and cross the Ohio River, uh, even if they have a Bonaparte, you know, Napoleon, you know, little short guy, big power guy. <clears throat> he said they can't do it. If we're going to destroy this country, we're going to do it to ourselves. And the bigger concern I have right now is twofold. One, people with my color hair are not maintaining the fiscal discipline of the country. And we expect that we can just turn this over to you young folks, this debt, this increasing debt every day, and say, we're not going to tax ourselves. We're going to take all these... these, these uh, benefits on board, and you've got to deal with it. We'll just transfer it to you. When you get old, you're going to find this big debt. And by the way, how big is the debt? As big as that record-breaking budget was for the Pentagon this last year? Record-breaking. Probably by next year, we'll spend more than that every year servicing the debt, sending that money to Moscow or Beijing or Riyadh or Tokyo, wherever it's going, to the people who've bought our, our bonds, who've loaned us the money, and we're gonna be sending that money back overseas. No nation in history has retained its freedom, its liberty, its military security that couldn't keep its fiscal house in order. But even more worrisome is what Lincoln warned us about. And that is we're separating into these little warring tribes. We won't talk with each other. We're contemptuous of others. We don't think that the person we disagree with might actually be right once in a while. And as we go into this more contemptuous role, we become almost perpetually in elections. I understand in an election that I say, I'm smart, you're dumb. I'm right, you're wrong. Not always nice, not always civil. Uh, I accept that. Uh, welcome to democracy, kind of raucous. But especially for you young folks here, that isn't the right model to stay in governing where you try to divide and get yourself elected. Once the election's over, you have to go into governance and governance is about unity, not dividing. We got to come together, spend those 55 minutes, roll our sleeves up to find the problems and let's take time to do that and then solve it. And that worries me more than anything that right now, and this is a problem with all of our Western democracy, not just America. Look at what's going on in London right now. You know, this is becoming dangerous. We, we have to understand experiment of democracy can fail if we don't think it's valuable and precious and defend it. What <clears throat> advice would you give your younger self? Um, well, well, don't mess with the police. <laughs> <laughs> No, uh, it probably, um, you know, for you young folks in the audience, don't wait until you've got my color hair to do something, okay? You're pretty impatient now, and that's a good thing. Do your homework and make a difference now. Uh, don't wait until later. And I bring this up because we need fresh ideas, we need vigor, and you don't need to be running for national office. Run for school board. What could be better in your local area the making certain that the young people growing up are going to have good education. <clears throat> Run for city manager or, or become the mayor. 
you know, do things where you're rolling up your sleeves and you're putting your thumbprint on it because we need that right now. I'm part of the luckiest generation. I was raised by the greatest generation. I'm not so sure what we're turning over to you is as good as what we got from the greatest generation. You need to step up quickly and start challenging people with questions and be impatient, say, we want some governance going on here. We're no longer accepting that you can just sit on your hands when there's problems. Take the time to listen to others and make certain that you define the problems well enough that then you can go to work and solve them. Okay, a couple more. Um, do you believe the Taliban deal is likely to result in more or less stability in Afghanistan? Yeah, I'm not going to comment on current uh, situation. I don't, I don't know enough. I don't know the back channel. I know we've got some great negotiators uh, here. But one thing about it for all of us, we're going to have to decide what we stand for and what we won't stand for. And when we got there to Afghanistan, I went in right after 9-11, and I remember kites suddenly being flown over the stronghold that the Taliban had held. I remember how proud the children were, especially the girls, as they walked down the street on the first day of school, walking by heavily armed U.S. soldiers, Marines, sailors, SEALs, foreign troops, because when we were attacked, other allies came to our aid here in America, okay? When New York City and Washington, D.C. was attacked and we carried our values forward. And now for the first time in these young girls' lives, they could go to school. It worries me if we don't think those kind of rights are valuable for everybody in the world. And we're not, I'm not saying we gotta go around being the world's policemen. That's what alliances are for. But we do need to keep our moral voice and our leadership foremost. Okay, a couple more. Uh, could you discuss the interplay of climate change and national security? And also, what do you think of the solutions like the carbon dividend plan that your Hoover colleague, Secretary Schultz, advocates? Yeah. Well, I think the carbon dividend plan makes sense, but I, let me talk for a moment to those who are skeptical <clears throat> about, uh, about climate change. Uh, I used to tell people, I'm not going to get into who caused it because I was in the military. We're going to have to deal with it. There's now a new open body of water that from a military point of view, we have to deal with because the sea ice is no longer where it used to be. To me, this is just science. I'm not going to get into the politics of it. But now that I'm in a position where it is, I'm, I'm no longer just in the military side of it, I would say to those who are skeptical, even if it might not be the case, if there is a chance that it's climate change and it can be as potentially catastrophic as some think it could be, wouldn't it be good to have an insurance policy? I mean, wouldn't you just, I mean, I, I, I haven't had an accident driving my car ever. I still got insurance on my car. Wouldn't it be a good idea to do that? I'm trying to find some common ground so we move forward here because why on earth would we take a chance with something that big when you can see the sea ice receding in ways it's never receded before? So I would work on it on defining the problem in a way that is irrefutable, and at least to about 80%. I think we live in such a skeptical age today that that's probably a magnificent number if you can reach it. Uh, but then we've got to do something about it. In terms of national security, there's a lot of reason to look at what happened in Syria in the, as far as the Civil War goes as relating to a drought. It's hard to tell a drought. I spent a lot of time in the Middle East. Sometimes it always looks like a <laughs> drought over there. <clears throat> but a drought that drove many small farmers off the land to the city, rents went up, not enough seats in the classroom, people are angry, a uh, fruit seller uh, sets himself on fire in Tunis, and the anger just comes through the Arab world, and, and uh, it was, you know, you can draw at least some conclusions that this has uh, indirectly fed into much of the discontent in part of the world and the refugee flows. So again, my question to the skeptics would be, wouldn't you at least take out an insurance policy on this? And last, finally, um, Kierkegaard said, happiness is to will one thing wholeheartedly. And your life is more coherent than almost any other life I've encountered. You're, the Marine Corps has been your community, your sacred mission, your belief system, your mm -hmm. moral community. Uh, you're out of active service in the Marine Corps. 
Uh, you're out of the Secretary of Defense unless Bernie Sanders asks you to come back into the arena. Um, <laughs> Uh, what's your calling now? What's the calling for the rest of your life? Well, the reason I wrote the book was I wanted to pass on what I'd learned along the way. But really, the, well, I, it was the absolute pure joy of serving alongside Marines that kept me there. <clears throat> it, was, it was more than just the Marines. I wasn't in the Marine Corps. I was in the U.S. Marine Corps. I was answerable to all of you in this room for how we did our operations, for... Uh, the spending of your money, uh, the combat we went through. And I, I, I really had a love affair with the U.S. Constitution. I, I, I even enjoy reading the doggone thing, just rereading it again. You can find great things in it, uh, you know, that you think you've read it 10 times or 100 times, and you find something else in there that's great. And it's really the idea that this is so precious that it probably can't even be taught to you how precious it is. You've got to almost sense it as you read it and think of these young and old guys sitting there, starting with the declaration, and when they sign that, they know they're signing their lives on the line. I mean, if King George catches them, they're dead. That's all there is to it. That's the way kings did it, you know? And for us to have this today, this experiment seems so precious to me that I will commit whatever I can to helping young people become the leaders they want to be I don't care if it's in business or their diocese or in their small town or wherever it is. And I don't have all the answers, but I can tell them, here's what worked for me. Okay. I don't know whether to thank you as Secretary Mattis or General Mattis or Jim Mattis. Jim Mattis will do fine. Thank you. Thanks, David. Thank you. I think we're done, David. <laughs> <laughs>